You're listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, brought to you by the Raven Creek Social Club, where we talk about faith and other oddities. For questions, comments, or to be part of the conversation, join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you can find us at Raven Creek SC. Now for your hosts, Emily Dixon and Nathan Underwood. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome back to Faith and Other Oddities, the show where Emily and I read the Bible, talk about it, and uh, release the results into the wild after we've recorded them. Um, that being said, <laughs> we are... Because we can't do it live. We don't know what's going to fall out of our mouths. <laughs> yeah, it's best if I get a chance to edit this. Actually, what, I, I, very, I do very uh, little editing, actually, on our stuff. Normally... Um, it's a safety net. Normally, I only edit out glitches or coughing, um, things like that. We we generally stay pretty well on track. What show um, have you been listening to? <laughs> oh well, not necessarily on track, but we avoid too much trouble. Um, <laughs> that being said, uh, I don't Truth know. We, advertising we, here, man. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we we do take our tangents, but I, I, we don't get so far off track normally that I have to edit a whole bunch of nonsense out. Um, <laughs> normally, we're you know, we keep our nonsense right where it was. Um, <laughs> right? Sure. Why not? Let, let's, let's make that our official cover story and stick to it. <laughs> faith, and other odd, the faith and other oddities, keeping the nonsense where it was. <laughs> I don't know. It's not, it's not a great slogan. <laughs> well, that, you know, slogans require brevity, and brevity is not our strong point at all. They say brevity is the soul of wit, so I guess our wit is soulless. I don't know. That, Something like that. I, is that how it works? You know, I just blame the Cobb genetics on this particular trait. So uh, coming from a family of preachers that just none of us are short-winded. So Yeah. <laughs> but and Of course, both of us hardly ever met a word we didn't like. Right? There's so many good ones. So <laughs> I think there's like one or two that I really don't like, but most of them, yeah. And Let's not go down that I, list right yeah, now. Yeah, I was, it, well, yeah. Well, we could get lost. Um, I was going to go with the words I liked, not the words I didn't like, because then we'd have to get an explicit rating on uh, iTunes, and we don't want that. So. It would be like the George Carlin special. Right. Anyway, um, <laughs> that being said, Bible talk is what we're supposed to be doing. Okay, back on track. <laughs> See? All the nonsense right where it originally was. Well, we are in First Kings uh, chapter six still, uh, and we were getting ready to take a crazy little detour. Um, I don't know if necessarily that's nonsense, but um, about cherubim, that's where we left off. Right. Because we were... Yeah, back to the Bible, which isn't nonsense. Yeah, exactly. And, but we're all going to talk about a little bit of nonsense that kind of came out of some of this stuff and uh, talk about uh, some of the things that have happened. Because, you know... There's this thing that we as human beings like to do if something is not explained to death and we don't have all the little minutia and exact details, we come up with ways to plug the holes or where we think there's holes. And we, we fill it in with all kinds of wild stories when honestly, the stuff yeah. in the Bible is better if you just go with the Bible. Yeah, they, they say nature abhors a vacuum and really that's more people i think yeah or the nature of people and <laughs> well i mean i don't think nature really abhors vacuums considering most of the universe <laughs> empty space unfortunately a lot of that on earth is between ears so anyway um but the uh, yeah so we're gonna we're, i just want to talk about cherubim in general for a little bit because I mean, it's kind of a fascinating topic i i really love thinking about these sorts of things and, you know, things that we don't have just that immediate obvious answer to and things that require mm -hmm. a little bit of contemplation, which. Well, let's, uh, before we get too far in uh, where you're at, okay. I, I want to repeat something that you mentioned last week uh -oh. and kind of ex expand on it a little bit. One of the, well, one of the things that you mentioned is there's, when we don't have a lot of explanation in the Bible, it's because it was probably something the culture was familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, so the, and, and I think we touched on this in another part of the show when we weren't talking so much about cherubs, is the, the biblical writers were not given a, a brand new words. They weren't inventing words. Right. Uh, so the, the, the cherub 
was or cherubim or you know with uh, it's not something that originated with the biblical text correct it's something that they would have been familiar with and so that's i want to make sure we get that in there um because you know i know we mentioned it last week Mm -hmm. but i I definitely feel like that's important for starting this conversation because the problem with the the, the problem with a lot of what we think of as holes in the biblical text are not holes necessarily in the biblical text. They're holes in what used to be common knowledge. Right, right. Where now we're so distant from where we used to be as, as, a, as people mm-hmm. and, and what's common knowledge that we just kind of... Uh, the, the, holes, the holes are in our knowledge. Not in the text, rather, is probably exactly. the best place to put it. Well, and we've said this multiple times before. Nobody, absolutely nobody expected, you know, two people in Oklahoma to be reading these books, you know, two, four thousand years later. You know, it, it, they, it just was not on their radar. You know, and actually, I was thinking about that. The, the I was thinking about that, just kind of the way the Bible is compiled and put together. Really, I mean, the only things that I, I'm looking at it going was the Pentateuch and the Gospels and maybe Revelation. Were those the only ones that people really thought of they were writing like for years to come? Because Paul's stuff is mostly letters. To immediate I mean, if you situations. Really look, yeah, if you look at Kings and Chronicles, that stuff's like, just kind of local history, more or mm-hmm. less. I mean, quote unquote. I mean, if you really want to look at right. how it came about, uh, a lot of the prophets in the Old Testament were writing to address specific situations mm-hmm. as far as they knew. Right. Um, so it's like, did, were, were any of these books planned out by anyone other than God to be preserved <laughs> in the way that we have them? Yeah, that's a really good question because you have to, you have to ask yourself exactly how much did the writers know? I, and, mm-hmm. you know, unfortunately, we don't have the answer to that. Now, one of the criteria for being included in the Hebrew canon was that the information had to be written for all ages. It had to be true for everyone throughout the, t- you know, known time. And mm-hmm. so if it, a book didn't meet that criteria, that's one of the reasons why it was cut. And this is actually is an interesting point, because when you get to Enoch, and I believe it's verse two of the first chapter of the book of Enoch, it says it wasn't written for the present generation. It was written for a future generation. And this is one of the reasons why it's excluded. I mean, it, it self-excludes itself from the Hebrew canon. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. so you know, it's, there's some interesting little points in there like that, that you kind of go, okay, how much did they know? What, how much foresight did they have? I don't know. Um, right, you know. right. And, and, and I, I think we do tend to look at the, the Bible in some ways. And so, there, you know, Again, back to forcing our own perspective, our current perspective on ancient times or or recent history mm-hmm. and you know like antiquity, I guess not you know, <laughs> uh, would be you know it, it was kind of funny I actually so this is kind of a rabbit trail, but it kind Imagine of is to that. make the point yeah, it's kind of to make the, the the point here about reading our current situation into things I actually so you and I both were homeschooled mm-hmm. you know. Please don't stop listening. Um, <laughs> that and the one of our, our history book. I remember there was a section on music in one of our history books, and I don't know if you had this or if you remember, but it talked. It was it, this section was talking about you know composers, mm-hmm. and they were talking about classical music versus pop music, and it was funny to me because they were talking about how classical music was music that was composed to last for centuries and you know transcend <laughs> the ages and and pop music is just people doing what happens to be popular at the time and how it's and it's and and, uh, and but if you look at the way music was arranged it's that they were writing what was popular at the time right. the same as the psalmist the same as every other what is now considered a classical composer well, and the other th- it, it's <laughs> Go ahead. Well, the other thing that people don't consider is the really bad classical music, the stuff that that wasn't as great as what survived just kind of fell by the wayside. So we do have mm-hmm, only mm-hmm. the greatest examples left really in our repertoire of that period of music. And you know, yeah, we've got to quit thinking that, you know, they all wrote these amazing, you know, 
orchestral pieces to to um to be these great statement pieces that you know yeah people who lived before us were not better than us and people who lived right. before us weren't worse than us either they're yeah well and and they composed the stuff that they composed for the same reason you have pop artists doing what they do because it sells you write the music you play the music you record it because it sells and uh and and as far as you know and of course this boils you know this this runs into the <laughs> hymns versus modern praise music uh debate as well and and it's funny to me whenever people get into this because it's like the 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 hymn books especially protestant hymn books that's a that's basically a a 400 year compila- greatest hits compilation right. that's not that's not saying that every hymn that was written was fantastic Mm -hmm. because they were somehow specially anointed. I mean, it's, it's just a a dumb argument. There's some really awful hymns out there. Yeah. And and there's some really bad praise music out there (laughs) and, 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 uh, you know, modern music and, and quite frankly, and this is, I'm going to get a little petty the way some of it is so droney. I'm like, we, this is, this is, we're back where we started, <laughs> you know, um, I'm going to leave it there, but, um, we should talk about should the cherubim. <laughs> well, yeah. And all that to say, read history with the lens through, through the perspective of who it was written to, if you want to get the full picture. Yeah. So, okay. So I'm actually going to pick up on that historical piece that you threw out there because, um, you know, this is where it's great. We do have other podcasters who help us. And I was having some technical difficulties. And uh, Tim Stedman from Answers to Giant Questions, actually, I put a put a post up, said, hey, I need some screenshots of the, the uh, Dictionary of Deities and Demons. He got right. those to me because uh, I was could not seem to ac- access it. So uh, access it. Need more coffee. Uh, is anyway. It a, is it a PDF? That you were trying to get a hold of? Yeah, yeah. It was just a yeah, large with file. With your connection out there, mm-hmm. because that, I mean, the PDF version of that is huge. Yeah. So a lot of this information is going to come from that, which uh, which you can look this up online. There is the PDF version. It's free. It's online. They have these great articles about all kinds of different uh, biblical topics. Highly recommend it. I do want the, the you know, the hard copy because that's the kind of person I am. I will, I, I want that, but. I think they're like four hundred dollars a copy. The last time I looked, yeah, they're they're not cheap. No, no. So, um, which we should also note, we are recording. Speaking of things that are not cheap, on a, a new computer that our patrons actually allowed us to purchase. And good grief, uh, how amazing is that? Um, I know we're kind of meandering, yeah. but like we recorded last week. We, you, and I talked. As I was driving about getting this new computer, you pulled the trigger, just decided it was time. I get home. The next time I try to use the laptop we used last week to record, nothing. Black screen. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, our, our patrons made it possible for us to continue recording without more than just a little hiccup. So. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and the laptop came in yesterday. Yes. Uh, right on time. So, <laughs> yeah. Just, just, it was, it was kind of funny. And I don't like, I don't know what. And what it might be God, it might be the Holy Spirit. Well, I guess that's the same thing, different person. I don't know. <laughs> Again, Trinity, it's weird. It's awkward. <laughs> um, I don't know how to explain it, but I don't know if that was the, the Spirit prompting me to order it, or like you said, if it was God holding the other one together <laughs> until I finally record, uh, ordered it. But yeah, it was, it was pretty funny to me that you, I mean, I was a little worried because I didn't realize you had already gotten the stuff uploaded. So I was worried I didn't have last week's recordings, but it was a little bit amusing whenever you said, Hey, the, so the MacBook died. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, great. Uh, You know, and that's kind of been like, if you wanted to give a synopsis of our lives and how things have worked out, it's kind of like that. It's where you, where you scream in terror for half a second and then everything kind of falls into place. So uh, anyhow, but we just, I just wanted to pause and say thank you to our patrons because, um, much. you know, right now, I mean, it wouldn't have happened without you guys. So, and gals. So, Anyhow, DDD, the Dictionary of Deities and Demons from the Bible, excellent resource. I'm pulling a lot of information from this particular article. It was like three pages long. Um, 
and and don't let that title scare you off. It's not a it's not a book, you know, telling you how to contact demons. It's not it's it's a, literally an index of deities and demons that are mentioned in in the Bible. In the Bible. Uh, and probably actually it goes beyond that too. It just basically most supernatural beings that are mentioned in kind of your A&E kind of uh what the spirit realm was perceived to be. And yeah. so you can you can find so many things and there's things in there that I wouldn't have even thought to put in those categories that they have articles on. So, um, but very well researched, uh, scholarly, not, not sensationalist. They're looking mm-hmm. at good resources. So if you need a resource for a paper or something, be sure and check that out. And um, now one of the first things they started out with was looking at the etymology, because that's what you do whenever you're dealing with these ancient uh, titles and names, because often they're descriptors. And, the etymology of cherub, which cherub is the singular in Hebrew, and anytime you have a Hebrew word that ends with the im, the im, or the m, then you're talking about multiples. It's the plural version, and so mm. the the word here is kind of unclear. We they think possibly it's based off an Akkadian word, um, and this Akkadian word was used to refer to genie, like yes, the genie in the lamp. Yeah, and and also. Cherubim, uh, seraphim, cherubim, those are transliterations mm-hmm. as well. Yes. Those, aren't, those are basically our best English replication uh, of the word. It's not translated into anything for us. Precisely. Precisely. And so, um, you know, amen is another one. Hallelujah. We have all of these words in, in Christianese that we use that were, you know, they're based off the Hebrew. So, you know, everybody who has been in church for a amount of time has a little bit of Hebrew. Uh, they just don't realize it a lot of times. So now what's interesting to me is the fact that we're talking about genie right off the bat, uh, the, these mythical beings who, who are spiritual. And now the DDD didn't go into this, but um, one of the things I found out when I was doing my research on, uh, for my thesis was that our word genius is actually based on the word genie. It's, it's somebody who's led by a genie. Um, in the Greek culture, we have uh, Plato talking about his daemon, the demon that, that leads him and inspires him. And he's not talking like a demon, like we're talking New Testament. He's talking about a spiritual being that brings him insight. And mm-hmm. Eve, go ahead. Yeah, well, and, and even, even in English, uh, early uses of the word genius um, you would not say someone was a genius as you'd say they were visited by genius, mm-hmm. uh, that, that they had an encounter with genius when they had a great idea. It was like genius was a source of something that, that inspired you to create or do. It was not a, a, a identity uh, right. like we do in modern English where we say someone is a genius. Mm-hmm. So I, that's another way to kind of look at the etymology of that word. Well, and that pattern kind of fits with how the word inspiration was used, because to be inspired was to breathe in the breath of a deity. And mm-hmm. so Adam was inspired. This is what, is what gives him life. And of course, now we know that we talk about inspired artists or inspired ideas. Inspi- and so inspiration is something that is bestowed on humanity by a deity. Uh, typically in the Christian culture, you know, we're talking about God. And so I thought it was really interesting that this is where they begin. They, they make that connection between the genie and the cherubim. And so the two being kind of parallel. And then the DDD suggests that we consider the Egyptian iconography of the Sphinx, which I think we're all familiar with the Sphinx, you know, the, lion of the, the body of a lion, the wings of an eagle, the face of a human. And if this sounds familiar, it's because you're probably pulling up those memories of Ezekiel, and we're going to talk about Ezekiel later. Now, the cherubim and the sphinx actually serve the same function. Uh, they're guardians of a sacred tree or they're guardians of the throne. The only difference really being that um, the Egyptian sphinxes do not carry the throne. They just flank the throne. So they're a little different from the Hebrew uh, cherubim who are actually part of the throne or the chariot. And we'll talk about the difference in that a little later. Now, the Syrian sphinxes, uh, they carry or become part of the throne. So as we move a little further um, into the ancient Near East, where around Israel, we see this throne iconography. And one of the most um, interesting examples, which I 
just was kind of blown away by are these ivory plaques from Megiddo. And they're also found on Mediterranean scarabs where you have these sphinxes as you know, these throne bearers that the king would actually be um, seated on them. Now, the point being in making all these cons- uh, comparisons is that these were well-known images throughout this area, throughout the region. And it's not just in form, it's also in function. They're, they're tied to this idea of either gods or the representatives of gods in the form of a king. And one of the mm-hmm. more interesting um, images that we do have is um, there's an the image of Hiram. Hiram of Tyre, the one who Solomon contracted with to help build the temple, seated on cherubim. So now we have this whole debate within scholarship talking about how much was the cherubim iconography within the temple influenced by Hiram and his, mm-hmm. you know, his participation in building this. Now, there are differences in the, cherub, uh, the cherubs in the temple and the tabernacle, and that's part of what sparks this debate, because within the, the temple, we're talking 10-foot tall cherubs or 10-cubit uh, tall. Uh, in the tabernacle, they're, um, they're only a cubit and a half. In the tabernacle, they're kneeling. In the temple, they're standing uh, with outstretched wings. And so there's, there's a little difference in form. And but the thing is, even though there's some debate, we can see that um, cherub imagery was already part of the Israelite, you know, you know, consciousness at this point. It was something they had already been familiar with, even before Hiram uh, entered the scene. Now, most people agree that the cherubim in the temple, uh, one of their functions was with their outstretched wings, was to actually form a seat, and by forming a seat, they're, they're creating a throne where God could sit, and then the, the Ark of the Covenant became his footstool. Now, cherubim are mentioned over 90 times in the Bible. That's how prevalent they are. They are not kind of one-off um, inclusions. We have a lot of uh, references to them. Their very first reference is early. It's Genesis 3, verses 24. Whenever God has driven Adam and Eve out of the Garden of the Eden, and it says he drove out the man and the east of the Eden, he placed the cherubim and the flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So this is our introduction as biblical readers is this Garden of Eden imagery where the cherubim is the guardian of the tree of life. And he is the one who prevents humans from trespassing on territory that they had been forbidden to enter because they had broken relationship with God through, through rebellion. So it's, it's really interesting that we have them there because when we look at Solomon's temple, and then later on, if we ever get to Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel's temple, which by the way, Heiser has done a great job with Ezekiel, so uh, I don't really plan on picking that thread up very soon. Um, <laughs> But um, the the cherubim are almost always presented in conjunction with the image of a palm tree. And often they're alternating patterns, a cherubim and palm, a cherubim and palm. And so you have this visual reminder, this cue, that you're supposed to be thinking back to the Garden of Eden. You're supposed to be thinking back to that place where God and humanity walked together and they talked and there was that unbroken relationship. So as you're coming into that temple, you're being reminded that this is how we're supposed to be functioning as humanity. This is what we were created mm-hmm. to do. And there's also this abstractness about um, cherubs that, yes, they guard the tree. They're supposed to uh, keep humans from, from encroaching on territory that they're not ready to enter into. But they're not just um, barricades to sacred space. They're the throne through which God enters into our space. They're, they're the means by which he becomes a part of our reality in a real tangible way and in a way that can be witnessed. And so mm-hmm. in, in many ways, they don't guard or block the road. They are the road. And that's not something that I'm, I'm pulling out of my my. Um, never mind. Won't finish that stage. But um, <laughs> so their depiction in the Bible um, reminds us that the that the the cherubim reside in a place that's outside of time, 
And so they provide, like I said, they provide that, that transition. And even with what I found was interesting, when we talk about Jesus ascending to heaven, I think there's a hint of them there. They're not specifically named, but if you look at the ascension accounts, Luke 24, 51, Jesus was carried up. Acts 1, 9, he was lifted up. And in Mark 16, 19, he was taken up. So this idea that they become the means of transportation, not only for, for God to enter in or to raise Jesus from the earth, they also are part of uh, humanity's quest to engage with the spiritual uh, realm. So we're going to talk about that here in a little bit, because that gets all sorts of crazy. And, and when you're talking, uh, you know, I, I, I want to clarify, you're not saying that they are like Jesus saying He's the way, because you kind of said that they're they're kind of the the road or the route. Right. You're talking about for an encounter, not necessarily, but not like Jesus saying he is the way of like salvation. I want to make sure we correct we clear that up because we we don't endorse worshiping angels. We none of that. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. No. It, it's almost like, and I was going to go in here later, but since you brought it up, I think it needs to be we can address it here. Um. It's almost like they're a level of protection between humanity and God's holiness. And mm -hmm. so they, they kind of provide that buffer that allows there to be some interaction, but still with safety and still being able to, to um, you know, engage without being obliterated. And, you know, all of sacred space, and that's something we need to recognize, all of sacred space in the Bible required certain observations, uh, ritual in order to, to enter. You didn't just walk into sacred space and do whatever you wished. There, there, were, there were rules. There was ritual. There was things not because this was necessary for you to know God. It was to keep you safe. It was to, to remind you that God is powerful. He's holy. Just he's, you know, all of these things that run counter to human nature. So, um, you know, th this is very much a part of the role of the cherubim uh, as being that that transition piece between the two mm -hmm. realms. And, excuse me, this is most notably displayed in Ezekiel. And Ezekiel 1 describes uh, Ezekiel's vision of God, where he's enthroned on the cherubim. And he, Ezekiel describes the attributes of a cherubim. It's probably one of our more detailed accounts. It says that each one has an animal-like characteristic, the lion, the eagle, and the bull, which these are the highest forms of life of these three categories. So, mm -hmm. uh, and by the three categories, the lion, of course, is the king of the beast. Uh, the eagle is recognized as one of the most majestic, efficient hunters of the, of the uh, birds. Birds. Yeah. Bulls are one of the most powerful domestic animals that we have. And then, of course, they had a human element. And so while Ezekiel offers this, you know, probably the most popular and striking imagery of God on the cherubim, and he calls it a chariot, the idea was already in place within the Hebrew mindset. I mean, if you go to 1 Samuel 4.4, 4, it reads, so the people sent to Shiloh and brought from the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, a uh, covenant of the Lord of hosts who is enthroned on the cherubim. Psalms 18.10, mm -hmm. which this is attributed to David when... Um, We've got it repeated in um, 2 Samuel twenty two eleven. 11, basically the same verse. It says, he rode, speaking of God, on a cherub and flew and came swiftly on the wings of the wind. So in David's time, this was already popular imagery but way before Ezekiel. Psalms 80, attributed to Asaph, one of David's um, musicians of the temple. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim shine forth. And then in 2 Kings 19, 15, Hezekiah prays to the God of Israel enthroned above the cherubim. And the prayer is also recorded in Isaiah 37, 16. So, and in Hezekiah's case, he's actually praying for, the God, for God to intervene as a warrior king and to come fight against Sennacherib, the, the Assyrian. He's saying that God's going to come in this chariot. And who rides in chariots? Well, these are warriors. Warriors go into battle on in chariots. Now, Cherubim continued to be very popular in Jewish literature. Enoch, the book of Enoch, refers to cherubim specifically as part of the uh, heavenly host. Enoch 14 
Um, the writer pulls directly from Ezekiel uh, chapters 40 through 48 to describe the arrangement of God's throne room. And in mm. these descriptions, the cherubim are no longer statues representing a living being. They are the living being themselves. In the Apocalypse of Abraham, we have, uh, again, a description that's almost identical to Ezekiel's. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have a description of God and cherubim, and it, it reads, the cherubim prostrate themselves before him and bless. As they arise, a whispered divine voice is heard, and there is a roar of praise. And when they drop their wings, there is a whispered divine voice. The cherubim bless the image of the throne chariot above the firmament, firmament and they praise the majesty of the luminous firmament beneath the seat, his seat of glory. When the wheels advance, the angels of holiness come and go. And then, of course, we find them again in Revelation. Um, uh, chapter 4, verse 8 says, uh, has, gives us a description of the cherubim offering praise to God's throne in heaven. And once again, we have actual cherubim, not just representations like we see in the temple, which is supposed to be a replica of God's throne room within, within heaven. And it's supposed to give us that glimpse beyond. Now, we can't talk this much about cherubim. And the fact that they're part of the throne or the chariot without talking about Merkaba mysticism. And the reason why I'm bringing this. Of course not. Yeah, I mean, we have to. Uh, <laughs> this has really become popularized because Merkaba mysticism is an element of the Kabbalah. And right now, there's so much misinformation about the Kabbalah out there online. It's ridiculous. And a lot of, a lot of the teachings of the Kabbalah are very appealing. I know we've talked about it before, but they're very appealing on a surface level kind of reading. Uh, and mm -hmm. there seem to be a lot of things that run kind of parallel with New Testament teachings if you don't have the whole picture. And so I'm finding Christians who are getting sucked into these ideas, but not because they want to get involved in Kabbalah, but because it's getting out there without having the label attached. Um, mm -hmm. probably the most famous or infamous, I should say, is Rob Bell with the Zimzum, uh, stuff that he came out with. And I did not follow that. He lost me at that point. But anyway, it caused a big stir. This is when he became part of Oprah's uh, entourage and all of that good stuff. So, um, but that's a Kabbalah teaching that, that comes from this Merkaba or at least some form of Jewish mysticism. I, I don't want to be too specific because, again, I didn't read the book, couldn't work my interest up enough. So, mm -hmm. um, but, okay, so cher cherubs are these um, guardians of sacred space and the means through which sacred space is manifest. So they, they really occupy this unique position of preoccupation within the Jewish mind. And in particular, as the throne or chariot of God. So the passages in Ezekiel are what provide kind of the springboard. And this is the reason why it's so compelling for a lot of Christians to get caught up in this is because, oh, look, they're quoting scripture. And if you listen to any teacher, um, any Hebrew teacher, uh, a rabbi teaching Kabbalah, they're going to say, see, 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 it's all here in the Bible. And they're going to pull these verses and they're going to give you these numerical breakdowns and these special codes that show you exactly how it's encapsulated in scripture. Yeah, you can get there from here. Okay. I, I'm not going to lie. You know, some of these things really do seem to make sense and add up. The problem is you have to have the special knowledge in order to be able to get there. You kind of have mm -hmm. to have the decoder ring, if you will. And I'm not going to eat that many boxes of cereal. So anyway, <laughs> this... Well, and I, I, think, I think a lot of the appeal of, of Kabbalism uh, is, is that there's kind of a... There is that... We add up the numbers and it all works. Mm -hmm. there's, that, there's the formula piece. And I think that there's something about that, that even though it's all cloaked in magic and mysticism that appeals a lot to kind of the Western mindset of if I just have the numbers and the data yeah, and, and being able to, to break the universe down into a formula, even though it's kind of an ab abstract formula based on numerical values of corresponding letters and things like that, uh, that, that kind of seems a little kooky uh, in certain ways, um, then I, it, it it appeals, I think, a lot to the analytical mind because you can kind of hide your mysticism behind, well, if you just look at it, 
there is a formula. And, and I, I don't. It's why. I, I think that's a lot of the appeal of, of how it, it, why it's getting so popular, uh, especially because I'm actually, I, I'm actually surprised by how many very, I'm surprised by how many very smart people get into it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's why, it's, you know, conspiracy theories run rampant. Uh, you know, just, you know, look up COVID conspiracy and just Google that and see how many you can come up with. Um, you know, I mean, look up JFK, look up the moon landing, look up, I mean, nine eleven. I mean, Anything mm-hmm. you you want, and there's a conspiracy theory about it. Yeah, there's there's a conspiracy theory that there's a conspiracy theory out there that the real Avril Lavigne died in like 2002, um, <laughs> which is why one. all the uh, subsequent albums have not been as good. Um, <laughs> well, now that you mer- bring it up, that kind of makes no, never mind. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> what happens is she was replaced with an <laughs> imposter. <laughs> Okay, so basically they... T- I, I really don't think her music is important enough to society for that, to be honest. No offense to her. She's, you know, she's making in the music business. Good on you. That's, that's great. Um, okay, well, we're going to file that under way out there, other oddities. Um, so anyway, the reason why this appeals is because those cherubim, because they form this, this chariot or throne, the idea is that if you somehow manage to gather some kind of access to to this throne, then you can be transported to heaven. And when you're transported to heaven, you can actually spend your time, you know, exploring these heavenly chambers and gaining insights and learning things that can help people here on earth, you know, live a better life. Now, in the charismatic circles I've run in, I've actually heard people say that they were transported to heaven and they saw great big storerooms where God had extra body parts for people who were ill and people who, you know, needed a new leg or they needed a new heart. And you just had to go to heaven somehow and get one because it was there waiting for you. You just needed enough, enough faith. So we can't say that this is just like some kind of ancient superstition. This is still very alive and well within the church. And um, yeah. So. The, I see your wheels turning. I, I had a thought, but that, what you said, just, I completely forgot what I was going to say <laughs> whenever, uh, whenever you started down that road. I was, I have not heard anyone teach that, um, but yeah. I, I don't put it past anyone with some of the other things I've heard. But then as I was speaking, I did remember, but the, that's where, um, oh, some of you have probably seen the, the tree of life model, mm-hmm. uh, that is based on the numerical formulas. Uh, that's actually one of the things that you were talking about. If you could figure out how to ascend, and part of that is finding out the right numerical combinations in order to breach the walls between uh, the different spiritual realms. Okay, um, and uh, the common thread here, and what everybody needs to pick up on, is how hard do you have to work, and how smart do you have to be in order to do this? You know, it, right. it, and so now we're taking grace out of the equation. This is the problem with the system. And so now one of <laughs> one of the problems. Yeah, we're going to talk about a few more. Uh, but the Talmud, uh, they attribute the, these teachings actually back to Rabbi Ishmael, uh, Ben Elisha and Rabbi Akiva. And if you do any reading in Jewish history, you're going to be familiar with those names. I'm not going to take time to fill everyone in. But it's almost for certain based on writings that predated ev- either of those men. Um, because we do have so many Second Temple teachings that um, deal with the cherub. Now, despite the biblical inspiration and the reported powers that came with um, mastering this art or practice, uh, it's not something that was generally prescribed. The Mishnah says that the Maase at Merkava, the work of the chariot, should not be taught to anyone except he be wise and able to deduce the knowledge through wisdom of his own. So basically, if you're not smart enough to figure it out on your own, you're not smart enough to be taught. So, you know, that's always uh, a good indicator of what they have to offer. Um, to illustrate why these safeguards were in place, uh, the Talmud includes several stories. Um, Eleazar and Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, uh, they're supposed to have been studying the Merkava, and then fire descended from the heavens, and the trees began to sing, and the angels sang, and, uh, you know, so this great, powerful manifestation of God's glory was supposed to descend. 
But this wasn't always a good thing because uh, sometimes the students who were supposed to be studying this were surrounded in fire and any birds who flew above were incinerated. Um, those who were unworthy to study were warned that they would go mad, that they would lose their faith, uh, that they would die, or they would die a sudden fiery death. Uh, so even the, the rabbis warned against studying this with, for anyone who wasn't worthy. Now, um, in these studies, the cherubim weren't necessarily meant to help God enter the earthly realm, but they did provide that layer of protection that allowed humans to ascend. And they're present almost exclusively in the context of God's response to sin, um, whether we're talking wrath and judgment or we're talking forgiveness of sins and the reconciliation um, of humanity to, to God. So this is one of the reasons why the, um, this um, Merkava mysticism became so popular, because what happened after the, the loss of the temple, actually observing Judaism as it had been known to that point was almost impossible, because mm -hmm. so many of the feasts and so many of the sacrifices that were required, you, you can't do them now. There's no place to do these things, to, to make these sacrifices and to engage mm -hmm. in these practices. So how do you get to this place where you can worship God? Well, you can't do it externally, so you internalize it, you spiritualize it. It becomes something that you pursue in a very individualized form. And so this became a, um, a very popular thing to do and really began to take off in the Middle Ages in particular. But the reason why I bring it up is Kabbalah and the Merkava mysticism acknowledge what was lost. They acknowledge the fact that this connection, this place where humanity could go and be in the presence of God's Shekinah glory, they could interact. And, and you know, can you, I mean, we don't often think about what would it be like to enter a building that was aglow with God's presence? You know, what would that be like? That's what they lost. And so this is what they're trying to reclaim through this practice. So mm -hmm. by seeing what they're saying, what they're, what they're telling us that was lost, what they're working so hard to reclaim, we can get a little glimpse of what was actually present in the temple. So I, I don't want to, you know, that's the reason why I want to bring it up. I don't, I, wanna, I don't want to study the practices. I don't want to tell you how to do this. And I don't want to spend time putting it in my head, so I have to take it out later. But I, I think we need to, to see the purpose. What was the driving force? I mean, if your whole identity had been wrapped up in having this centralized experience and or even being influenced by the memories of those who had this centralized experience, now you can begin to understand the grief and the longing for this, this kind of relationship with God that allowed humanity to step into sacred space, to have that experience with the divine. And you know, the, the flaws of Merkava uh, mysticism are, are pretty, pretty prominent. I mean, number one, there's, there's limitations um, of, you know, it's only for the elite. It's only for the super wise. It's only for those smart enough to figure it out. It's an individualized practice. So it's not a community practice anymore. It, it's something that, yes, a teacher will teach a student, but it's not something for the body at large. Uh, it's, it was abused uh, several times throughout the ages for an individual to gain prestige. Um, it's the quest for God's concealed glory. And when you contrast that with the purpose of the temple, you, you begin to see some things that make it, where, while it has explanatory value, you see why it's not something we should pursue. Um, mm -hmm. So, because the temple was for all nations, not just a special elite individual. It's for everyone. Uh, it was mm -hmm. practiced in community, corporately. It was something where people came not together, not just with God, but with each other. And you began to really operate as a society where each person had value simply for being. Uh, the, the focus of the temple wasn't just for the individual um, who was rich enough to bring sacrifices. It was also for those who, who needed help. It was to offer charity and comfort to mm -hmm. those in the community. And also, it was where God's glory was revealed, not concealed. So we see the, the shift 
uh, in Judaism here from this, you know, engagement of the nations to this this kind of cloistering away, and it's it's become very so individualized that there's so many forms of Kabbalah out there now. There's not mm-hmm. like a single unifying. There's there's like a lunar Kabbalah. There's the Merkava Kabbalah. There's uh, one with the, that involves trees. Um, so many different forms. There, so which one is the true one? Mm-hmm. And so then we contrast that. I mean, we can go further. We can contrast it with Jesus whenever he arrives, where the knowledge of God is not limited to the elite. You know, Jesus invites everyone mm-hmm. to to come to him. We can talk about how um, knowing God doesn't rely on our works. It doesn't rely on our ability to figure out or how smart we are. And that he is made known through his word that's available to any and everyone with ears to hear. Uh, faith is supposed to be practiced in community. That's part of our Christian uh, mandate is that we do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together uh, or this, whatever. I, yeah, I need more coffee. Um, you know, righteousness is experienced through the care of one another because that's loving kindness. We, we extend loving kindness and charity to the people in our community and we love our neighbor. All these things that God has told us to do, that Jesus told us to do, and God's glory is again revealed to all, not just the select ones who, who get the formula right. So mm-hmm. anytime we begin to limit knowledge or an experience of God to some rarefied gift that God only gives to certain people, um, you know, they only grants privileges and powers to, to certain ones, we're straying into the realm of witchcraft. And that's what the Kabbalah and this Merkava mysticism winds up. And we're running the risk of devaluing God for who he, who he helps us be, um, you know, for the prestige. So, so, if the, <laughs> so if the elect start to look like the elite, your, uh, your theology might be off. Yeah. I mean, when we have a true encounter with God, if, if our response is to, our response is not to puff up, okay? Our, our response is not to go, oh, look how great I am. All of the prophets, when you read their stories, when they encounter God, they don't go, oh, look, I'm so amazing. They freak out because they've been mm-hmm. encountered with the holy. They've had an encounter with something greater than themselves. And so we have to be very careful not to think more of ourselves than what we should. And so I, I have a real hard time whenever we start thinking about interacting with God as something that, that's, you know, c- contained or, um, I don't know, limited to, to these rarefied individuals who are somehow uh, a little bit more holy than the rest of us. I don't, I don't find that in scripture, you know? Right. I, I, I just don't. And uh, no. I, I, I'm not saying that we aren't special and we aren't loved and that God, you know, isn't that we aren't unique image bearers of God as an individual. That's not what I'm saying either. There, there's that balance. There's that tension between being wholly unworthy and yet being created to do precisely that, to have this relationship. <clears throat> and so we've got to find that tension and we've got to be able to, to, Make sure that we're not erring on one side or the other, because I also, you know, I've known those churches where, you know, oh, you're just a worm, you're no better than dirt, and, you know, how special could you be because you're a broken, flawed, sinful human? Absolutely true, Uh, but also created in the image of God and loved by God and adopted into his family and cherished by God, so therefore I am more, you know, I'm worthy. And yeah, which and, and you actually use the phrase puffs up, which is uh, reminded me, you know, that's that's one of the things with with. Uh, I've actually seen where people have used this idea of knowledge puffing up to let anti-intellectualism run rampant in their uh, yeah. mind, uh, sometimes even in churches. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I love the well, you can't trust scholars because they're always looking for ways to. W- ways to to change scripture to say what it doesn't. And it's like, well, actually, no, no one goes into biblical studies. I mean, I don't know. I mean, there might be one or two people who go into biblical studies with the idea of this is going to make me a lot of money. 
Um, I don't, those people are probably deluded. Uh, they usually anyhow, fall out of the programs really quick. As soon as they yeah. go into seminary and realize this is actually work, they fall out. So, right. I mean, but you, you don't go into biblical studies typically without a, a, a deep love for scripture and, and a, a deep love for God. Mm -hmm. But the Paul's point there was not to not study. Right. His point was, is as you increase in knowledge, if you are not also increasing in love, mm -hmm. then your knowledge doesn't help anyone. Right. Right. And so if, if like, if we know something, if we know something more than our, our brother or sister in Christ, we can either use that information to condemn them and destroy them and tear them down, or we can love them and build them mm -hmm. up. You know, it's like the example I used a couple of weeks ago with the guitar player. I could take that information and say, hey, you're a terrible guitar player. He wasn't. Right. But it was like, hey, would you like to see how to avoid breaking mm -hmm. so many strings? Would you like to see how to take where you are from this level to the next level? And it's not something, you know, with, with everything else, it's not like a secret knowledge, you know, <laughs> when we get to talking about Bible stuff, it's not like a secret knowledge, it's not something we lord over them. It's like, hey, this, this can help you understand better. It's not something that saves you, it's not secret knowledge that gives you spirit, you know, super spiritual insight, but it's sharing. It's, it, it, it's, it's a different way of looking at it rather than just, uh, than just lording things over people. Uh, well, absolutely. And, and, you know, and that's, that's the thing we, we see this and I, I know there's some Christian uh, leadership who will automatically pull out, uh, you know, point out Kabbalah and this kind of mysticism as, as wrong. And absolutely, I, I think it is wrong. Uh, but anytime we see flaws in somebody else or another group, whether it's or an individual, I think we need to back off for a second and ask ourselves, where do I have that same tendency in my own thought process, in my own life, in my, you know, in my own approach to things? And I know in the Christian community, there is that idea sometimes that somehow we're just a little more special and a little better than everybody else. And, and that's not the point of what we know. That that's, wasn't mm -hmm. why God revealed himself to us. It's not supposed to make us think that, that we are better than other people. And, you know, that's really the quickest way to turn people off from seeking further information or a better relationship with God is for us to act like we we're better. And so, you know, we have, we need to be on guard and yes, we do need to be studying why it's so we have that, the answer in due season so that we know how to, to speak to people about these things, not because um, we just were imparted like the supernatural revelation, but because we actually put the work in and we mm. actually put the time in, not because it gets us more benefit or, you know, somehow makes our crown shiny or what have you. It's because we love the one who gave us the word. And that's, mm -hmm. that's what needs to be our motivation. And that's the difference. It, it's, are we doing it because we love the one who revealed himself to us through his word? Or are we doing it so we can try to control? the one who revealed himself in the word and simple example. Um, my, my daughters right now, um, I love them both dearly. Part of their, uh, part of their homework assignment right now, because they're in lower elementary school is read aloud for 20 minutes. <laughs> I sit and I listen to them read aloud for 20 minutes, not because I'm getting, you know, great. It's a great time to connect with them. You know, I do feel a sense of pride whenever they're doing a good job, but it's also, I don't sit and listen to them because I get a, I get some kind of great benefit from listening to them read for 20 right. minutes. I do it because <laughs> I love them and I want them to do well. You know, that's, that's, a uh, you know, kind of when we're interacting with God, we don't do it for the things we get. I mean, Sure, we can rejoice in those things and we can celebrate those things and we can be thankful and we can talk about those things, but that's not ultimately why we love God. Mm -hmm. 
Well, anyway, well, and that, that's the thing. I mean, I, there's that phrase around there, love the giver, not the gift. And, you know, I even kind of hate that because it's kind of like you know, that's the only reason why people are focusing on God is because he is the giver. And I know it's really hard for humans not to think in transactional terms. I mean, sometimes it's really hard for me to think that way with my husband, not to think that way with my husband. And so, well, I mean, even even the language of grace in the Greek is is fairly transactional. Well, it, and I think the thing is, I think we need to be looking at that as the limits of language. I, I, absolutely, absolutely, and and that's one of the things that you know, like if if you've been around long enough to know, we really like Heiser. Uh, <laughs> you know, one of the things that we were in one of the episodes of his podcast, he talks about um, someone brings up Calvinism and, and he, he mentions that basically what happens a lot of times is, and again, I hate to harp on Calvinism too much <laughs> on the, on the public podcast. We get on that Patreon sometimes, but the, um, one of the things he was talking about is a lot of times they're taking the death metaphor mm-hmm. of being spiritually dead and applying all the aspects of the metaphor to the reality mm-hmm. and you're over applying the metaphor sometimes. And I think that actually sometimes goes, uh, it, you know, when we talk about the, the limitations of language going into talking with well, the way Paul speaks about grace, because that is actually a transactional type of language that you would have in Greek. And, but we've made the word grace. It like, like you're talking about earlier, you said sometimes we know a little bit of Hebrew, but we don't really know. I <laughs> right. Mean, it, I was an adult before I actually learned what the word hallelujah meant. Mm-hmm. You know, I had to look it up. I had to find it. I had to search it out because it really was poorly defined in English dictionaries if it was in there at all. Right. Um, but we, the idea of uh, a, a lot of times we do this where we, we make these words so holy that we don't even know what they mean to the point where we don't even realize that grace was a word. Charis was a word that was used in Greek mm-hmm. regularly. Mm-hmm. People who spoke Koine Greek knew what it meant yeah. and they understood what it was to give grace to someone else, mm-hmm. what it was to overlook offenses or to give a gift mm-hmm. without expecting something back. That was that's what the word really means and it's it's not something that you know because i listened to a podcast uh, uh about i guess about a year ago but um where the the host and the co-host spent literally their entire well most of you no know, they had the <laughs> 20 minutes of banter before they got to the point which we do that sometimes but anyhow but they spent the rest of that time giving a completely incorrect definition of the word grace and reinforcing that too holy to utter type of language with the word too holy to define type of language when it's like no literally it's it's as simple the paul's using an analogy of how god interacts with us grace is not the fourth deity of the trinity <laughs> or however you want to phrase it you know it's it it, it really is a way of how we treat others and how we, you know, look at the world around us. Now, the way God extends it to us is beyond comprehension. But again, it's the limits of language thing. You know, it's, and again, on this, you know, words that are too whole, you know, in, in the parallels, you know, I once sat through a small group where we, they spent an hour trying to talk about what the word discipleship <laughs> means. I knew or, that was the example you were going for. <laughs> and I'm like, literally, like the definition is in the word. Disciple and discipline is someone who practices a discipline, a disciple. It's right there. And we don't have to spend an hour trying to redefine the word or talk about what it means to me or what it means to you. It doesn't matter what it means to you or what it means to me. It matters what the word actually (laughs) means because it's right there in the text. Anyway, no, but, but that being said, oh, I, I, you have a, a point here. I, I do, because actually you bring something up that's, that's really good in relationship to the cherubim, because they started out uh, as re- the beings that revealed God to humanity, the ones who, who brought God down from heaven to earth so that humanity could interact 
with God or, you know, mm. and, or they stood in that, that transitional space of the temple. And with the Merkava uh, mysticism, what happens is now they become so holy, we aren't even supposed to think about them too much unless we're worthy. And so there, there is that, that kind of weird thing that's going on that, that parallels where we, we take these things that God has given and said, here, you know, this is, these are the tools, this is the manner, this is the means, whether it's a word or an image. And we kind of built these fences around it that say only certain people get to really know what this is. Mm-hmm. A- and that's a problem. Because what we wind up is with Christians who, who use this terminology, and they don't know what they're talking about. And, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. they, they speak, of the, it's kind of like somebody, you know, if I went to Spain, I might be able to throw some words out there to get my, my, me, my message across, but I wouldn't actually be able to have... Your menu item. Yeah, yeah a combo planner <laughs> number four. Uh, anyway, you know, that... Th- but I wouldn't be able to have a conversation. I wouldn't know what I was talking about. And there's a difference between throwing out code words and being able to communicate. Well, and, and that goes a step farther even in our, in our Christianese to the point and where we talk about uh, evangelism. And we, we, the way we tend to look at things, and it creeps in that a lot of times you wind up with this us versus them mentality to the point where you're overly strategizing just how to talk to people. Yeah. And, and talking about, well, well how, do, how do we build relationships that, that can be evangelistic? And, and it, another time sitting through a small group and I, with, with the disciple, uh, you know, disi- disciplines in the word disciple kind of thing, I kind of like just... I couldn't take it anymore and kind of had an outburst of, of not quite shouting that, but saying it very pointedly. <laughs> um, and then the leader was like, oh, well, it seems like a good place to end. Same thing with this. I was like, I, I got to the point, I'm like, ask questions. Ask, ask, ask. People love to talk about themselves. If you ask questions, they get an opportunity. They have an invitation to talk about themselves. If you've asked the question, mm-hmm. they will talk about themselves, and that's how you get to know them. Well, and I- the leader was like, uh, okay, I guess that's a good place to end. <laughs> and the, the guy, you know, not to, not to fault the small group leader, it was just sometimes whenever I have my, y'all listen to the show. <laughs> anyway, but the, uh, it, it was, you know, it, but there was just, and usually it was a good conversation, but a lot, but every now and again, there was a, just those times. And I'm like, this shouldn't really even be a question. Just talk to people. They're people. Well, you know, you talk to people all the time. Just talk to them. You know, you know I, I think kind of too, because uh, I kind of think of it like this. Um, how do we build those evangelistic relationships? By being human. You know, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm, th- mm-hmm. honestly, it, it doesn't have to be a program. People don't need to be our fix-it projects. We, we just need to really be that neighbor and, and to love our mm-hmm. neighbor. And, you know, it, it's not hard. I mean, it, it is and it isn't. Because you, you and I, we talked about this. We don't do small talk well. It's just not something that, that we engage in. So we, that part's hard, okay? That's mm-hmm. difficult for me. But it's also not hard for me to, to ask, hey, can I grab something on your way over to the house? Can I do something for you? You know, something small. Can I, can I call you and see how you're doing? You know, t- send a text message. I mean, good grief. There's so many ways to, to just be human and have a relationship without it turning into some kind of project. And if you're really living your faith, you're studying your faith, you're, you're, you're keeping yourself uh, accountable to the dictates of our faith, that's going to come through that relationship. And it's going to to be something that's influential without being overwhelming to the point that people just want to distance themselves from you. And mm-hmm. it's amazing how many people you can have good relationships with if you're just human. And this is why I can't throw parties, because my friends don't get along with each other. They're from such total opposite spectrums of, of you know, society that a lot of times they don't know how to, to deal with each other. And it's it's not that I'm a wonderful person. It's that one of the things that we did learn from our father was how to have conversations with whoever was around. And mm-hmm. so, um, you know, that was, a, that was a learned skill. So, um, 
anyway, but you know, that was what we were created to be. We're human beings. And sometimes we just need to fulfill that mandate. I, and I think it's really is that simple. So, yeah. <laughs> well, that being said, seems like a good place to wrap. We're a little <laughs> over an hour and I have to be somewhere in about 30 minutes. So, <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, everyone, thanks for being here. I wish we had longer to, to discuss this week because it's, it's been a fun conversation. Yeah. Uh, Everyone out there, if you want to be part of it, Raven Creek SC on the social media, ravencreeksc.com is the website. Uh, come be part of the conversation. Thank you again to all the Patreon people who made, literally made this week possible. Right. <laughs> like, like without uh, your kindness, there wouldn't be a show. Absolutely. This week, just because there wouldn't be a computer. So um, thank you. I mean, if you, I, I hope what we're doing is, is helping and making a difference in other people's lives. Um, and uh, you're definitely making a difference here. Um, and I uh, want to say thanks. Uh, we really appreciate it. Absolutely. And we will see you next week. Thanks. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, a Raven Creek Social Club production. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you like what you've heard, please write us a review on iTunes or consider supporting us on patreon.com slash ravencreeksc. As always, thank you for listening and don't forget to join us next week.